Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Shepherd's Corner. I'm Deacon Derek Walcott. How are you all doing at this lockdown? You know, and it's not, it's not been easy for everybody, but I hope that you're tuning into Trinity TV, you're tuning into CatholicTT.org and all our websites. You're getting your Catholic news so that you can stay in touch with the Catholic Church and all its essential teachings. And as usual, on this beautiful Thursday evening, or if you're watching us on Sunday or any other day, or you're listening to us on Tuesday on radio, welcome to Shepherd's Corner Conversations with Archbishop Jason Gordon. And he continues his catechesis on the family, the domestic church. Good evening, Archbishop G. How are you doing, sir? I hope all is well with you. Well, because I see you, you're in a different corner this time. I'm in a different corner. I hope the look is okay. Well, well, the background is the same, but I could I could see the um, the technology is, has changed on you. Yeah. Well, you know, you have to improve. You have to improve. Thanks be to God. Well, today we're doing learning forgiveness in the family, so that's about continuous improvement. Well, boy, hear this. It is about continuous improvement, and I'm a little happy that I'm alone doing this with you. Forgiveness in the family. That's a little bit challenging. We, we should bring your wife into this, this, um, this show. What do you think? I'm glad she's working. <laughs> okay. If, if you say so, we will, we will leave it so for now, okay? So, starting with the question, how essential, no, it's a stupid question, but anyway, how essential is forgiveness and mercy in the domestic church? I would say, let me put it this way. If Air is essential for us to live, and water is essential for fish. Then mercy and forgiveness for the domestic church is like air for us human beings, and, and water for fish. Is that a clear enough imagery for you? Yes, it's a clear enough imagery. And thank God, you know what I mean? I'll share this later. <laughs> because I'll tell you why. It's, Mercy is, is really not an attribute of God. Eh? Some people think that mercy is. What I like to say is that mercy is what love does when the beloved messes up. And if mercy is what love does when the beloved messes up, then if people are like me, I not, I not continue, eh? if people are like me, then mercy has to be an everyday occurrence because I mess up constantly. And, and so when, when, when you understand that mercy is what love does when the beloved messes up, then you understand why mercy and forgiveness in the domestic church is like water for fish and air for human beings. My wife would love to hear this. I'm quite sure that many wives and husbands are tuning in. So... So mercy is so essential in the domestic church, in family yeah. life. It's like oxygen for us. It's like oxygen for human beings or water for fish. Take your pick which one you like. You see, <laughs> mercy is really a response of God to broken humanity. When we mess up badly, how does God respond? Mercy. And at the very core of Christianity, what, we, what, what is there, the very epicenter, is mercy and forgiveness. These, these two are the epicenter of Christianity. The, the number of parables that they have is, is, is astounding. But to understand that, that mercy is a pivotal player in the Christian tradition, then is to understand that this mercy is also a pivotal player in terms of the domestic church. Yeah, but what about when we grew up hearing about judgment, hell, retribution, punishment? You sure that's not the core? Because that used to be preached, you know what I mean? Hell and damnation. Well, you know, what I would say is this. Eh? If I was raising five boys, <laughs> and, and any of them was like you, I would be preaching judgment, hell, retribution, punishment very strongly, to try and keep them boys on the straight and the narrow. But however, however, that's not at the core 
the core of the gospel message is not about hell, damnation, and retribution or punishment. The core of the gospel message is about God, God's love for us, God's call to us. And, and if we choose not to respond to God, there are consequences. So the consequences or the punishment is not the core. It, it is because we choose not to respond to the core. And I think there's a, a fundamental difference there. Oh boy, I hope so, because a lot of us would be in serious problems if that was the core. <laughs> so well, you, say, you, you say Christianity as its core and essence is communication from a loving God. Mm -hmm. Who paid a very high price to demonstrate the depth of his love, forgiveness, and mercy. My goodness. You see, if we don't, if we miss that, that memo, then we, we, we have a kind of Christianity that is there to bring social regulation and to keep people in line. And that wasn't Jesus' essence or his call. That's what we've done sometimes with religion. The essence of Jesus and his core is that you have a, a daddy who loves you incredibly and, and come and experience daddy's love. That, that's the essence and core of Jesus' love. That's why when he says, when you want to pray, pray like this. What was the first two words? Our Abba. 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 Our Abba. Our Abba. Our daddy. That's the beginning of, the, of how we pray. And, and if that's how we pray, that's, that's how we understand God to be. And if we understand that, then we understand that the core is not a, a God of retribution or God of fear or a God of, of, of judgment. Those things might well be when we reject and walk away and go our own way. And it's not because God is giving us retribution. Is because there are consequ consequences for dotishness. <laughs> there are consequences. And when you do dotishness, <laughs> there are consequences. But do we, have, do we have any evidence of that in the Bible? Of what? God's mercy. I mean, I'm asking a so, question. So, I'm asking a question that you have answers, eh? <laughs> Listen, the last six weeks, where have you been? <laughs> The last six weeks, the gospel of Matthew, Matthew 13, Matthew 15, Matthew 18, Matthew 20, the last six weeks of Matthew's gospel, where have you been? So the great um, parable from Matthew is the man who owed um, 10,000 denarii, 10,000 talents. Now a talent is 6,000 denarii. A, dar a denarii is a day's wage. So that's 60 million days wage the, the person owed, which is 200,000 years of labor, is what the man owed. And the, the, the master forgave him his debt. And he couldn't forgive the debt of somebody who owed him three months labor. And, and, and that's, that's a central parable, the prodigal son. I mean, we could just go on and on and on with parables that that are there in the Bible that speak to this recklessness of God in the way he forgives us as his, his people. Wait, but you say the recklessness of God. I mean, thank God he reckless with his mercy and his love. Because a lot, of us, yeah, a lot of us will be burning. Man, is like the old time preacher, turn or burn. <laughs> turn or burn. No, but, and that's why some commenters have said that they, the, the parable should not be called the parable of the prodigal son. It should be called the, the, the parable of the prodigal father. It's the father who's prodigious with his wealth and squanders his wealth in giving it to a boy who don't understand the value of it, who didn't work hard enough to get it, and who squanders it. Is really the father at fault. If you, if you gave your son all your wealth and he went and squandered, you can't blame him. It's you. You should know the character of your child. It's your fault, not the, not, not the boy's fault. I see you quoted from Luke 6, 36, which says, be merciful as your father is merciful. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and, and, and that speaks, I guess that speaks to all of us, 
challenging us to be merciful like God because we, you know we are judgmental. I'm a judgmental. Absolutely. You know Absolutely. I mean? But that's, I, that's why, you know, in the parables, they speak so eloquently. So, I mean, the lost sheep, that God will leave the 99 good sheep to search for the one who's gone. The good Samaritan, you know, the man beaten up on the way and, and the way that, who was, who was the neighbor? The one who, who became a neighbor to the one in need. The, the unmerciful servant, we talked about that one. You know, there's so many parables that speak to, to this thing called mercy that we really need to, to understand. But again, another pivotal teaching when, when Jesus says, be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. That's a cornerstone teaching. So St. Matthew will say, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He allows his sun to shine on the good and the bad alike. His rain to fall on just and unjust alike. And, and in understanding the mercy or the perfection, we understand about the indiscrimination nature of God who will shine on good and bad alike, rich and poor alike, black and white alike, everybody alike, because God is love. And love does love. That's what it does. Now, I know that you're pointing and today's topic is learning forgiveness in the family. Now, you know, that is really a challenge in the mm -hmm. family um, because, you know, some it's family sometimes that hurt you the most. It's family right. sometimes that disappoint you the most. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You see, a family knows exactly what buttons to press. They become experts <laughs> in knowing where the nuclear button is. And they could reach the nuclear button in three seconds flat. Him. You could be having the best of conversations and three seconds later, boom. And, and, and that, that's because people you love the most, you trust the most, can wound you the most. And, and that's, that's the nature of family. But, but it's there that you grow the most to, both in forgiveness, in love, in reconciliation, in all kinds of ways. Boy, and you, you know, you see, if you want to belong to this family and be like God, then mercy must flow. Boy, that must take plenty of prayers. And that, that's well, all thought, Lord, you have to be constantly in prayer for that to happen. Well, you tell me. <laughs> I tell you. you. You tell me. You see, any family that you belong to, Adults are going to see things differently. They're going to react differently. They have different personalities. And, and two adults who love each other to death could be arguing and quarreling in, in three seconds flat. For all kind of, and, and when you look back, it's real foolishness sometimes, you know. When you look back at it, real, real foolishness. But, but you only really argue with people that you, that you, you love, you know. If, if, if you didn't care about somebody and they do stupidness, you just leave them there and go. That is your business. But it's because you love that, that you end up now quarreling and, and nagging and, and, and carrying on because you love. If, if you didn't love the children and they want to go to a party on wherever it is and, and whatever age they are and they want to do whatever it is, if you, if you really don't love the children, you let them do anything they want to do. Because it ends up with, with them looking at you as, as, as a nice guy. But, but when you really love them and for their own good and their own sake, you say, that, I really don't think that this is where you should be um, going out tonight. I, I really think you're much too young for this. But you know drama that will unfold next. I have been in that drama. <laughs> I thought you were going to tell me not in my household. <laughs> I have been in the drama? Yeah. You're not, go listen to me, all you have exams, nobody is going out. You, you, listen, they, do, they hear that ringing in their ears, right? Since yeah. they're so small. You know what I mean? No, 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 wait, wait, wait. But, but my friend doing it, my, my, 
and, and of course it's war after that they don't like it that is he was singing in the house and he was singing right, right. my my sister had a line anytime she was going to give unfavorable news to the children she said could we agree on a few things i am the wicked witch from the from the west we could agree on that could we also agree that i'm the worst mom that has ever ever been could you also agree that I'm mean, horrible, and terrible? We could agree to these three things. Now that we've agreed to that, this is what I need to say. <laughs> <laughs> she put it up front. She, she put it out up front. They are not more to say. What, what are they coming back to say next? Because, and this is the other thing, this generation of child, we've not taught them how to be disappointed without coming apart emotionally. I mean, we were disappointed. You know how much, how much things I wanted to do that, that my father said no? You think I could have guff up and pout up and, and tell him I hate him? You think, it, it, that, you think that, could have, that could have fly anywhere at all? That can't fly? So, so, you know, but these are the things where we have not had this generation to understand how to take face disappointments, how, how to not get your way and still be okay with that. And because we haven't done that, it means that the, the kids really have, uh, have been at a total disadvantage because they've never been taught how to, how to not get their way and be okay. Simple things like that, you know, and it's so important. What's beautiful in that scenario too is that in the family, yes, you may be disappointed and so on, and you will see that, but you will learn to forgive in the family. You know, right. I, and I love, yeah, I love your story and recounting it in this article that you had learning forgiveness in the family mm -hmm. when, you, when you spoke about the prodigal son, that amazing mm -hmm. parable. Yeah. But before we go to the prodigal son, you know, the, at the very heart of, of Paul's teaching on marriage, at his very core, is this text from, from Ephesians 5, huh? where, where Paul describes marriage as a profound mystery. And, and that profound mystery is, those are other words to talk about sacrament. Yeah. Um, so it was holy mysterium. In, 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 so the, the, the Eucharist was, a, was the holy mysterium. And, and the, 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 the word was a holy mysterium. And marriage is a holy mysterium. So these profound mysteries are the encounters with the living God. And it is out of this that you, you, you start to understand now where, where Paul is getting his, his understanding from. And, and why marriage and the domestic church is taking on the, the kind of life and, and legs that it has in inside of the um, inside of the church. So to understand that is is to see now in this holy mysterium, where the bond of the husband and the wife, and the fruit is the children. What is the role of of the parent? And and now we have the prodigal son, because when the child mess up bad, what does daddy do? Daddy don't stand his high horse and say, well, let him sweat. And da, da, da. No. What does daddy do? Remember, mercy is what love does when the beloved messes are bad. Okay? Remember that. Mercy is what love does when the beloved messes up. So when the boy messes up bad, mercy is what the father does. It's not what the older brother wants to do. You want to string him up and, and have him for, for tea. But, but mercy is what the beloved does, or what the lover does when the beloved messes up badly. And, and from that perspective, this parable is really a centerpiece because here you have the display of mercy inside of a family. A father has two sons and both of them worthless. But, but, but hold on, wait, 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 wait. Oh, you can call the first brother what less. He stayed by the father's side. He did everything mm -hmm. the father asked him to. He was outside cutting in the field, sweating. Agreed. Are you going to say that the elder son was also what less? Absolutely. Because he was there with the father. He knew the father. 
He saw the father. He saw how the father was. And still, still, he was unable to forgive his brother. What less? I get it. He out, I... he outside, he pouted up. He, he vexed, blue, and, and even how he said, all these years, I slave in for you. And all this time, the boy didn't understand what the love of the father was for him in his life. He missed the whole memo, you know. He missed the whole memo, what less? Well, I, I see in your statement, in, in, your, in your article, you say, we see in the married couple the visible reality of the invisible grace of the love between Christ and his church. So obviously, the yes. elder brother did not observe this invisible grace and love and this, no. this God of mercy, this no, daddy no. of mercy. And, and, that's, and that's the thing that, that the, the, if you don't get this mercy, if you don't get this love, if you don't get that, then it's really difficult to understand because the family is really a, a sacrament of Christ's love for his church. And so the family is supposed to be where we experience how God loves his church. And, and that means that, that the, the relationship with, with parents and children and siblings and on and on is important that when a mess up happens, that that mess up doesn't really scuttle the thing completely. I think that's a, 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 that, that parents, uh, husbands and wives, should really listen to this message, should really take on the relationship between Christ and his church to understand how to, yes. as spouses, yes. they are supposed to be. Because, boy, we could have some wars there, and the Absolutely. children, don't see for, they don't see love, they don't see forgiveness, they don't see compassion. What they see is two angry parents Biting at each other's throat other. constantly. Yes. And therefore the kids themselves are now scarred for life. But mercy is what the beloved does when the lover messes up. I'm sticking with my definition, you know. <laughs> so you talk about the church miniature and the church grand. Now this is a, a mm -hmm. big thing. The church miniature mm -hmm. and the church grand are interconnected. Mm -hmm. Expand on that when you say the church miniature, which is the domestic church and the church grand, realizing that in the church miniature is where you have to learn love and forgiveness and mercy. And let's yeah. talk about the big church now. Well, you see, if you think of the domestic church as the church miniature and the, the parish or the diocese or the universal church as the church grand, everything we talk about up here is, is to be lived here in, in the church miniature, in the domestic church. So the church miniature and the church grand are directly interconnected. And this is a sac the sacramental nature of marriage. The, 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 the relationship between the husband and the wives reflect the relationship between Christ and his church. And, and this here is only a reflection of, of, the, of the other thing. And in that reflection, what we, we start to understand is the nature of the sacrament and the nature of the sacrament of marriage. And so the church grand goes, so also does the church miniature go. So if the, if the universal church is a place of love and, and, and hope and joy, then, then domestic family will also be reflecting that. Mercy, love, joy, hope, peace, kindness. If the, if the domestic church is love and peace and joy, then, then the, the church grand is going to be love and peace and joy. Because it, they're interconnected. You can't, one doesn't move without the other. If, if you want to move the domestic church, then you have to move the, the domestic church and you have to move the church grand. So that, that you have to see how these things are related. So if you want transformation in the church, you have to start with transforming the family. And it's, it's the work that we do in the family that would allow the church to have true transformation and for people to really live with courage the gospel message again. Wow, that, 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 that piece is, I'm going back to one of your first teachings on the catechesis of the family, that how critical it is for us to get that domestic church right. Correct. 
Because if we don't get the domestic church right, then the grand church is wrong. Everything else wrong. Everything else going to be wrong. And that's why forgiveness and mercy are essential for the church grand. And so too, they have to be essential for the church ministry, for the domestic church. We, we can't talk about a domestic church, about a family, without, without understanding that's a school of mercy and love and forgiveness. How, how, how well did you learn to love and where did you learn it? It had to be at home. It's at home. And, and if it was not learned at home, where was it learned? The only other place was in church. God's, God's love and mercy in church itself. But I learned it first at home, you know, living amongst many brothers and sisters, yes. watching daddy and mommy, how they operated. Mm -hmm. And so that allowed us to say, boy, they could really forgive each other, boy. You know, after a fight yeah. like that, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, 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 and therefore that allowed us to, to be people that would be a little open to when yes. the lover, when the beloved messed up, <laughs> the lover forgives. That's it. And in, in that act of forgiveness is also the, the act of growing up, of maturity, of, of, of responsibility, and of, 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 of stretching your heart wide. Because what we want to do is, 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 is when we're in a conflict, we want to narrow down the heart and go straight to justice. You did this to me. You wrong. To go to mercy is saying, well, I know it is you who do it to me, you know. We say what? I still love you. So I, I forgive you. That is harder. I, I love the teaching that comes from Matthew and Luke in a sense. It gives us the male perspective. Now, I want to change it. It gives us a male perspective because I think women women are more compassionate and yeah. easier to forgive than, than yeah. men. We hard back Absolutely. men. We like, to, we like to hold grudge. You know what I mean? And so they show us what a merciful father is. The prodigal father. The merciful mm -hmm. father. Because mm -hmm. we men are the ones who find it hard to forgive. Yeah. I don't know who finds it harder, no? But, but let me just say, we have our pride and ego. And for us, our first forgiveness is, is more a matter of pride and ego. I think for women, it's more a matter of letting go the, the grudge because they feel they hurt deeper. And, um, and it, it just, it's just different. Yeah, it's, yeah. Just, it's just really different. You spoke about, um, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus gives the power to forgive first to Peter. I think we come into the sacrament here. Yeah. So in, in, in um, at Caesarea Philippi, he says, um, you know, you are Peter and on this rock, I build my church. And what you bind on, on earth, consider bound in heaven. What you lose on earth, consider loose in heaven. And so the power to forgive or to loose or to bind was given to Peter directly. And then after the resurrection, Jesus um, breathes on them and gives them the Holy Spirit and says to the apostles, whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. And again, you get the, the sending of the Holy Spirit, the empowering, but, but also the, the, the giving of the power to forgive sins to the apostles. So to, the, to, to Peter and to the twelve, this power of forgiveness has been given. And, and that's why it should be used by the church and availed because God wouldn't give something if he didn't think we needed it. I think there's a real good reason why God, God gave us the power to forgive sins. I really think so. And if we don't understand what that power looks like and how to use it well, we will never have a mature church or mature discipleship or mature family. You see, for the big, for the big church, mercy and forgiveness at the core and center of its identity, so too must it be for the domestic church. So whereas the big church focuses a lot on mercy through the readings, through all kinds of things, the domestic church really is where this mercy has to be lived out at. I mean, you forget to do something that you promise somebody in your family when to do. Well, that is just thunder, lightning, tears. 
But if there's no forgiveness, then the relationship just fragments. But if there's relationship and forgiveness, then the relationship bonds and the person would have messed up, but that doesn't mean the relationship comes to an end. So it's, it's about understanding those relationships and, and really understanding what mercy really is and why it's always going to be core and center. I want to take the, 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 the viewers back a little bit um, to part of the catechesis on the family when Archbishop G shared with us about our whole family going to confession together. Yeah. And I think that that is critical because it shows that, hey, daddy and mommy could mess up too and we go into the big church so that we could get forgiveness. We could, you know, say that we've messed up and that we need God's forgiveness, taking us yes. back to whose sins you forgive them. And then the whole family going out. I mean, I've seen it too, eh? where your daddy, mommy, and about four, four picnic sitting down. Swing back. You know? yes. Swing back. You see, what is the family if it's not a school of love? What is the family? What, what, what brings the family together? This man say he loved this woman, or this woman say he loved this man. And, and out of that love, uh, a union is born. And out of that union, children flow. And out of the children, the love is now taken to the, to the next generation. But, but what is a family if it's not a school of love? Because if the family understands itself as a school of love, then the family understands all the ways in which it needs to help the members of that family grow and mature into the image that God calls them to. I'm doing, working with um, a, a core team from teens, you know, and they said something that was amazing where both husband and wife went to confession together. So you had husband and wife going to father to, to, to basically confess their sins together. Not, not one at a time, but together. I, said, I, cool. I wonder if I could do that, boy. <laughs> well, I will, I will tell you why it will be easy, easy for you. Because any sin you forget. <laughs> <laughs> if you only forget a sin, any one of them, you get in the elbow, what about? <laughs> what about? So in one sense, your spouse probably know your sins better than you. <laughs> Pressure. <laughs> That's why I'm glad we're doing this alone. <laughs> you see, the family is really the school of love. And it is right in the family that the spouses learn the true meaning of love. And, and this, this is a love that moves from eros to laying down one's life. Uh, and regardless of the feelings or the desires, Sometimes, you know, when we're good and we're nice and so we live one thing and when we're not, we live something totally different and much worse. But it is in the family that we learn how to love consistently. And love not as, just as desire or sexual desire, but, but love as a gap, as a laying down of my life for the sake of the other person. You see, in the family, the spouses learn to love, learn to forgive and show mercy to each other regularly. And this opportunity for grace is not always recognized, taken, and lived. All right. But when the spouses uh, demonstrate forgiveness and mercy in the family, it allows that family to reflect more perfectly the big church and the love that Christ demonstrated in giving himself and the love of God that gave himself for our salvation. So if I want to throw, if I want to give, if I would like, I would like to ask you then, then how, how would you challenge, let's say, say, daddy, mommy, and children in terms of forgiving and showing forgiveness in a family as an example, an activity that they could do, you know, in the family to, 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 to basically, you know, exemplify and show love? Mm-hmm. You know, there are simple little things we could do. So before the Sunday meal, 
okay? We could have, you know, we have any Sunday meal now. We talk about that. Know your rights, huh? <laughs> know your rights. So before the Sunday meal, we could have a nice little table with a, with a cloth and a bowl of water. And we could invite each person to come and say something that they are sorry about, that they've done wrong to the family, then wash your hands, and let the next person wipe your hands for you. Then you are holding the towel, and the next person comes and says something that they have done wrong against the family. You wash their hands, next person is holding the towel for that. That, that simple ritual of forgiveness would be, would be um, very profound. Another little one would be to, to take a crucifix and have it in a very prominent place and, and recognize the connection between my sinfulness and, and that blood on that cross. That is a, that's a no-brainer also. There, there are many little rituals like this that we could put together. Um, I remember one of the rituals that we had as family um, that we used a couple of times was having everybody sit in the living room and whoever holds the football speaks and right. they can say yeah. exactly how they felt about a particular situation, but they must say it respectfully. And right. when that person is speaking, nobody else must talk, they must listen. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> and that was a listening and an active exercise. Yeah. But these are the, the things that we can do to help the forgiveness to move along inside the family. Because at the end of the day, the family is a school of love. Um, it allows, I think it allows the family to reflect more perfectly also the big church and the love that God demonstrated in giving his son. Mm. And I think uh, as part of church, as part of our Catholic DNA, we need to also share with our children, you know, these scriptural passages that you have in this article of God's love and God's mercy. Yes, because without that, we will not have the, the, the family becoming what it needs to become. The children wouldn't grow up with the capacity for love and they wouldn't understand that, that the real purpose of family is about loving. And remember, God is on mercy, God is love. Mercy is what the beloved does or what the lover does when the beloved messes up. You know, he said, we were forgiven. We were forgiven when we did not deserve it. You know, so too in the family, forgiveness is given when, oh good, when it is not deserved. When it is not deserved. All right. Because I it have is been, only... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, I would say because I, I've been forgiven many times when I didn't deserve it. I mean, I'm being honest. I'm, I'm, I'm giving a confession here, you know. And that's why I will say, don't take into tomorrow. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't, don't take into tomorrow the, the business of today. If, if you vex with somebody today, don't go and sleep on it. Just do something and clear it up so that tomorrow you start over anew and afresh again. So I think this is a, a very important bit of advice for families. Don't take into tomorrow the unforgiveness of today. How do we teach our children to forgive by witnessing to mercy on every possible occasion? Every, in season, out of season. Convenient, inconvenient. Good time, bad time. Keep witnessing to mercy on every possible occasion. Wow. Then the family will be a school of love, a domestic church. And ultimately, that formative self of society. That's a, that's, a, that's a lot. I think, you know, very often I would even share that at weddings, share that at um, preparing spouses for, for marriage. You know, and we see it, eh? don't let the sun go down, don't, you know, no. on your anger. But that's a hard thing sometimes, you know, Archbishop G. Hello. I know. The easiest thing to do is live and let live. But is it the best thing to do? And it is the best thing to, 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 to not let the sun go down. And, and a couple told me how they are helped 
is that they've made a promise to pray every night <laughs> together. So if you're say, vexed, oh my goodness. If you're vexed, you can't pray. If you're vexed, you can't pray. You know? So you have to sort out the vexation before you start the prayer. And so when, when children see their parents forgive each other and witness the radical and costly nature of love, they experience forgiveness and learn to forgive. Yeah, and that, that is important. Because, you know, we have this thing of cheap grace eh? and cheap love. We, we act as if love is, is just a, a cheap thing, but it's not. The, the price for God's love for us is the death of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. It can't be cheap. It can't be cheap. We, we can't go about dealing and talking about love as if it's this easy, go lucky, cheap kind of thing. It's not cheap. When Christ gave himself on the cross for you and for me, he knew what he was doing and he was fully conscious. But that's what the lover does when the beloved messes up. You see, boy, when forgiveness is difficult for you, consider the price that God paid for our reconciliation. And, and you're challenging us to meditate on the, on the cross. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You see, if not, then where are we going? So in the family, the spouses learn forgiveness and they show mercy regularly. And the opportunity for grace is, is not always recognized. You know? And that's why it's not always lived. But, but it is in the cross of Christ that we start to see the real price, the real price of, of forgiveness. And so when, when we understand that as the price, then the spouses demonstrating forgiveness and mercy in the family is really participating in that cross that Jesus has already borne and died upon. And, and it, the, that's why the, the cross is so pivotal to love and mercy. But, but when we demonstrate forgiveness and mercy in the family, it does allow the family to reflect more perfectly the big church. And, and the love that God demonstrates in giving his son for our salvation, that's what, what is really so important. But, but forgiveness is really a tough, tough cookie. I don't know about you. Is it easy for you to forgive? I come in out straight. No, it's not. It's humbling. It, 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 you know, ego is a hell of a thing, you know, and therefore admitting I've messed up, you know, mm -hmm. or, or, or to forgive somebody that has hurt me deeply. I am being straight up, you know, yeah. it, it's difficult. It's difficult. Yes. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, forgiveness is difficult for every human being. That's what I think. And, and some people, it's easier than other people. But I don't think anybody, it is really totally easy. It might be easier, but not totally easy. But if we could at least stop and acknowledge that this forgiveness thing, boy, this thing bad, it's real tough. And, and we need to do some work on this. If we could at least start by acknowledging that, then we could get the work done out. And then we could help other people in, in what they, they're dealing with and moving forward. Remember the debt we owed to God was so big we could not pay it if we lived a thousand lives. The debt to our neighbor is very small by comparison. And then you take us straight into this fourfold process of forgiveness. Here, hold on a minute. The fourfold process of forgiveness. People, I only hope you got your Catholic news last weekend. I hope so, you know. His grace pulled us all the way through, you know, and learning forgiveness in the family, we know it's hard, right? And so I did this process because some people will say, yeah, 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 no, but I want to forgive, but how do you do that? Well, okay, let me break it down. There are four things you need to do. The first one is to tell your story to someone that you trust. That if something really traumatic happened, you need to find somebody and tell them the story because if you don't speak it out, you're ingesting it. And if you're ingesting it, that's not going to be helpful for you. The second one is to name the hurt that you receive. Not everybody, the hurt that you receive. And the third one is then to choose to forgive. 
And the last piece is renew or rework the relationship. Why is this so important? Well, when we've been traumatized and we live with the trauma, it, it disconnects the brain in incredible ways. But when we can talk about it with somebody we trust, it connects back the brain together and it starts to make more sense to us having told the story than it did before we told the story. And so that's why the first step is important. Tell the story to someone you trust. The second step, name the hurt that you receive. Now, somebody could have done this and that and the next, but what is the hurt that you receive? Because that might be the front you know. Sometimes, like, you know, somebody has done you something, and, but they can't see it, but what is the hurt you have received? Name that. And as you name that hurt, you have a freedom now, based on the first one, to tell the story. Now you have a freedom to see how this is affecting your life, how this has affected you. Then after that, the third one is to choose to forgive. You know that forgiveness is a matter of a choice? Eh? No, I didn't know that. It's a matter of a what choice. You can so either choose then? to forgive or not to forgive. Absolutely. So what is it then? If it's not a choice, what is it? If somebody have a gun at the head and say, do you forgive me? The answer is absolutely. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 100% plus back. But, but forgiveness has a hurt in it. And we have to name that hurt. Because without naming the hurt, I've forgiven you, but I'm not going to heal. So naming the hurt is important for the healing. Then you choose to forgive. All of that person, and now you're choosing to forgive. And what are you choosing to forgive? Well, that's the hurt that you receive. And then the last point is renew or rework the relationship. There's some relationships that cannot be reworked. If, if somebody had abused uh, a person, you don't rework that relationship. You want to move on from it. But it doesn't mean that you need the person tied up with unforgiveness. Or if the person remains with unforgiveness, you know, how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you cope with that? So you, you have to renew, we choose to renew or rework the relationship. Somebody who abused somebody, well, the person who was abused does not need to be the best friend of the abuser. But what they need is to be able to, re, to forgive that abuser and, and say, look, you know, I forgive you. But, you know, yes, it is stupidness, yes, but I forgive you. No ifs, no buts, no ands. It is only in, 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 in understanding that last piece, you understand how to move forward. Because some re relationships get strained, you rework it, and some are broken. So you, 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 don't, you don't rework that relationship to be close, you, re you rework it so that there's a kind of a separation. So in, 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 you say that forgiveness does not mean you do not feel the pain. Because some people feel that, well, forgiveness means you have to stop feeling the, the pain that this person caused. You see, that's not so. It mm -hmm. means that you wish the person well and not bad. Yeah. You want their yeah. blessing and not their and not curse. curse. Oh, God, pressure. <laughs> but it is it is. Putting the, it is putting the person into God's hands. Yeah. So if somebody has abused you, you know, you might forgive that person, but, but you would never allow yourself to be vulnerable around the person again. Yeah. So that's a different, that's, that relationship can't renew easily. It has to be reworked and, and, and worked out differently. So the, for, for the, the thing of forgiveness is really important for the domestic church to start to look like the big church. And that is really the, the, the connection and the importance of the, of the teaching on forgiveness. It is the glue that holds the family together. Yeah, but you know, there are sometimes like abuse and so on, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, um, 
when you see, what about the hurt that you get from abuse? How you deal with that? Well, you still forgive, you know. You still forgive the person. But it doesn't mean you go back into a place where they can abuse you another time. Good. You, you, you have to have your boundaries also. So you, you understand that, okay, this person has abused me. Um, I think it's a terrible thing. But, uh, you know, I'm going to forgive them because I'm not going to stay with the unforgiveness. So I, let me forgive them. And then you, you negotiate how you do that. You fulfill the process. I think you're also seeing that if it's a situation of abuse, then you can't say that I'm going to get back into that kind no, of relationship no. that would expose me to continued abuse. No. no. No one has to put up with abuse. No one. And so if, they, if what is happening in the family is abuse, when the relationship is abuse, then you say thanks but no thanks. But you don't have to put up with abuse. Yeah? You see, you see, it it need it may need disengagement to be reworked for your safety and good. And this too is a process of forgiveness where every step is vital. Absolutely. And, now, and it is only in understanding that mm -hmm. that the, the forgiveness has these 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 steps, these four steps. If we do the four steps, we'll come out at forgiveness. In, in families, um, now we have about eight more minutes, you know. So mm -hmm. in, in families, would you say that, uh, as we heard with, with, with one couple, they made sure that there was couples prayer and, and, and family prayer that that helps in the in the whole yeah. family understanding. You know what I mean? Yes, and and the, the, the couple prayer and the family prayer is so important because that's sometimes where the forgiveness happens, huh? Right there, you gather to pray, you reach out, everybody holding hands, and you say, "Well, Father, I I ask forgiveness today when I I quarrel and I get, I I sorry." I ask your forgiveness too. It could happen right in the family prayer. And the habit of family prayer makes the occasion of forgiveness a lot easier to, to manage. I'll give, you a, I'll give you a story. <laughs> a quick story, because we only have a couple of minutes. I remember our dad, you know, sometimes in correcting us. After, after we got, after we were corrected, and it might have been, you know, a slap on the back or the or whatever, you know, and he would come back and say, this was to me was the hardest thing in the world to take. Now, daddy loves you. And you know why daddy corrected you? Because he loves you. Yeah, that, that was more pressure than the licks. No, give me the licks and don't give me the old talk. <laughs> you know what I mean? What, what about when they used to say, this will hurt you? It hurt me more than it will hurt you. You're right. I never, be, I never believe that. <laughs> but, but there's an importance in connecting the relationship with the discipline. Because the, the relationship is why the discipline is the discipline. If, if daddy did not love you, daddy will let you do anything you want to do. The reason why daddy is disciplining you is because daddy loves you. I heard it many and, times. <laughs> and that one is a... Uh, is a um, thing, but clearly you, you weren't learning very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> clearly. But, but forgiveness is in the family. It's in the family. What's your key message now for all those looking at us, watching as you continue to journey with us in this catechesis on the domestic church? Mercy and forgiveness are essential for the domestic church for the spouses and for the children. So mercy between spouses, mercy between spouse and children, mercy between children and children. It's essential for the domestic church. Without mercy, we can't talk about the domestic church, we can't talk about the holy mystery, and we can't talk about sacrament or God. So it's okay. really essential for the, for the domestic church. And the, the action step, 
I'm asking people if they would do an audit of their relationships and review those where there's been hurt and unforgiveness. And, and if they're still lurking, reflect and see where the hurt and unforgiveness is lurking right now. And pick one person and, and also pick up a small stone and walk with it for a while until you're ready to forgive. And when you're ready to forgive, then you release the stone with a prayer. But as long as you're trying to find the path to forgiveness, you walk around with the stone in your hand or in your pocket as a constant reminder to you that there's unforgiveness work to be done here. The moment you do the unforgiveness work, the moment you, you get in touch with the person, the moment you deal with it and make it right, you let go the stone. You know, that, 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 that action step there about walking around with a stone, you might have it there for some days, but it will always be pushing against your foot, in your pocket, right. in your hand, all right. and all it right. will remind you all, all the right. time. You all know, right. I'm not letting go. I, I, I have something yeah. here that... And, yeah. and I have... And, and the, but the stone is a reminder that you need to let go. You ain't supposed to collect that much or hold that much. And then, you know, what's the scripture reading? Well, the scripture reading is from Matthew. Matthew 18, 21 to 35. That's the big parable on forgiveness, which is the, the man who owed the 200,000 years of work, of labor, and the other man who had four months of labor, and, and how the, the forgiveness squared out with, with each other. But it, it's really, um, I really want to emphasize that forgiveness is essential to the domestic church. And if we would become a lot better at forgiveness, I think our families would be a lot richer, a lot healthier and a lot better. Archbishop Jay, we want to thank you for your conversations, taking us to this whole catechesis on the family. Mm -hmm. Just to let everybody know, he is thinking about packaging it so that, because a lot of people called in saying, well, how could we get this teaching? How could we get this teaching? Actually, somebody WhatsApp me just to say, don't forget about the, the, the rights in the family, about not putting your elbows on the table. And, and, you know, a lot of people WhatsApp after yes. the rights, seeing yes. a number of things that yes. we may have forgotten. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. So let us pray. Father, we thank you for your incredible love. And we pray, Father, that you give the grace to families to forgive, to forgive one another, to forgive richly and deeply, that as you forgive us, Lord, that we may forgive one another. We make our prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Archbishop Jake. God bless you. God bless. All right.